Hi, I'm Richard Bilderbeek and I would like to present about this topic. It will be about a, a presentation of uh, peptides uh, that give an immune response, that's why I call them epitopes. Um, like usually an epitope is defined as something that gives an immune response. Here I will use just the presentation of peptide fragments using an MHC1 or 2 complex with a focus on uh, peptide fragments that are derived from a transmembrane helix. So this presentation can be found on GitHub. Uh, that's a CC by NCSH license. So let's get started. So presenting epitopes um, is done by the major histocompatibility complexes in humans. Uh, there are two classes, one and two, whereas one is mostly most important for detecting um, a viral infection within a cell. It's a flag for a cell to show that it's doing fine. And MHC2 is about uh, cells talking to one another. And in 2017, uh, Bianchi, Text and Van den Boogaard, they discovered that, um, that these epitopes are derived from a transmembrane helix more often than you would expect by chance. And that's weird, because uh, in this picture that I took from that article, here we see the proteasome, that's how it's taught in uh, university. The proteasome shreds proteins in the cytosol, and those are presented. And because it's in the cytosol, you would not expect anything from a membrane protein to, to be shred to pieces and presented. However, these guys they discovered that that happens more often than you would expect by chance, and it does happen. Um, so um, that's why. Uh, so they don't know the mechanism yet. So they don't know how these uh, membrane proteins and especially the transmembrane helix proteins uh, are entering, did are are loaded upon these MHC1 complexes. So that the mechanism is there. Um, has been found, and also it happens more often than we'd expect by chance, which is shown in this graph. So this is a bar chart in which we see the HLA hip haplotypes, so the MHC1 uh, complex molecules in humans. Uh, and here is the percentage of epitopes, uh, peptide fragments of nine amino acids long, that overlap with the transmembrane helix. These red lines are the percentages you would expect by chance. So so approximately, like a rough estimate would be that 5% of the whole proteome in humans is a, a transmembrane helix. Well, then you would expect out of randomly peptide fragments that 5% is a transmembrane helix, is presented by the immune system. But apparently this value is higher. So apparently the immune system is more tuned more attentive towards these transmembrane helices. And my job was, these two asked me, like, Richel, can you do this for MHC2 as well? And I said, sure. So I'll be going a bit into detail what I then need. So here's a bit of a schematic. Uh, so here we see um, a peptide or a protein. Um, and what I need from that is I need to have the topology. So here in zeros and ones, I can see if it's a transmembrane part or not. So this part is a transmembrane helix apparently, and this is either in the cytosol or outside of the cell. What I need to do from that is I need to count how many, um, in this example I use 13 uh, proteins of length of 13 peptides, how many of these spots overlap with the transmembrane helix and how many don't. For example, this spot, the first 13 ones, so approximately like this. This spot um, has no overlap with any transmembrane helices, whereas this spot, if you have a 13 mer, it overlaps with the transmembrane helix, and therefore we call this a spot that overlaps with the transmembrane helix. And if you use um, peptide fragments of 13 amino acids, then these are the total number of spots, which is the length minus 12 or 13. And of them, uh, these are the spots that have no overlap. And these have, so those are the number of spots and the number of spots that overlap with the transmembrane helix. 
And then I also need to find out which of the 13 MERS um, are an epitope, are strong binders, are presented by the immune system. So I need some software that says, all oh, right, here is one, going from here to here. Here's a second one, and here's a third one. So then I need to know the number of binders. And of those binders, I need to count the number that overlap with the transmembrane helix. So this one overlaps with the transmembrane helix. This one is completely within the transmembrane helix, but this is outside of it. And therefore we have two out of the three binders are transmembrane helix. And if you take a rough estimate, we see that there are more binders in the transmembrane helix than you would expect by chance. Uh, actually less, because 25 out of 31 spots is transmembrane helix, so you would expect 25 divided by 31. Um, but well, for three binders you, you can't get that. So I need these values to make this graph, where these lines present the, the spots that have an overlap with transmembrane helix, and the bars represent the number of epitopes that overlap with transmembrane helices. Great. So my goals were to do reproducible research. So I should be able to run it myself twice, or uh, at least partially twice. I should use modern and free prediction software. And uh, there's a spoiler that I will regret this. I'll show this later on. And my work should be of high quality, so it needs to be checked and, and, and good stuff. So there will be three differences with the earlier study done. So the first one is obvious um, that I need to add MHC2 haplotypes. So the earlier study only did MHC1. I'll be looking at MHC2. Uh, and we picked 21 haplotypes to have high coverage. However, how we define the binder is different. Like in written text, not, but in code it will be different. I'll show you later. And what I wanted to do is to use modern and free prediction software. So to start with that, um, in the earlier study we had there were two goals, which was to predict a transmembrane helix and to predict how much an epitope binds or how much a peptide fragment binds. In this case, only to IHC1, MHC1. The classical study used TMHMM, which was written in the year 2001. Um, and for the IC50 prediction, um, one of the authors wrote his own way of doing so based on the study in 2009. Um, but this is not generally used by other people. Um, whereas uh, this piece of software is old, uh, but you can use it from a server, it's still used, and now you can also call it from R by a package I wrote. But I want it. Um, so also this work is not free, that's why I won't use it, and this is not, this is untested, so I won't use, that one also doesn't work for MHC2. So in my studies I searched the literature for TMH prediction software, and I found PureSec TM in the year 2019, so it's very recent. And I want to use that, um, and for uh, IC50 predictions I'm went with MHC Nuggets, which is even more recent, and they can do MHC 1 and 2, um, so that's great. So that's why I, I chose these ones, they were modern and free. There are some problems, however, because the transmembrane helix prediction by PureSec TM has a command line interface, so you can only use it from, uh, from the terminal, uh, here where you type, um, and that doesn't work well in the pipeline unless you do the pipeline in, in that language. Um, and whereas the IC50 prediction software, and which is done by MHC Nuggets, is written in Python. Whereas I'm best with using R. So I can solve that, and I did that. I solved that by writing two R packages. So to call PureSecTM, I use I wrote the package PureSecTMR. And to do the IC50 prediction using MHC Nuggets, I wrote our package MHC Nuggets, sir. And this one is already on CRAN. Um, and CRAN is a public, is a place where people put their software so other people can use it, and it's already being used by others. So that's great. So this is a short demo how it works. So pure SecTMR gives the topology from a sequence. So this is the topology. This is you, can, you see it's very easy to use. 
um, to predict the IC50 of a peptide fragment like Fantastic D for this um, haplotype. You do you you write this predict 50 and then you need to it gives more information. I'm going only going to show you the IC50 results in this value. Easy, easy peasy. However, now something new comes up because a, uh, a deviation from the original study was the definition of a binder. So what is a binder? In the text it says of the article, I see 50 values for all nine MERS, so they use nine MERS for MC1, from the human proteome were predicted. The 2% peptides with the lowest IC50 values were defined as binders. So IC50 means inhibitory concentration 50%. Um, so that means at which concentration the, the peptides are bound um, to the MHC complexes and the lower that value is the better they bind because th the easier it is to, to block uh, to, to, to block it. So I, I'm going to give an example. So here we have uh, two peptides which are picked randomly and these values are completely random. Um, ARC and EX and for nine MERS we would have um, three IC50 values because one nightmare would be just the A's, and that apparently gives an IC50 value of 1. AAR gives an IC50 value of 1 as well, and ARG gives an IC50 value of 100. Whereas for EEC, it's the same thing except multiplied by 200. And I picked this as an example. So would the text, would we follow this definition? Um, that means we have uh, these binders, and the top 2% with the lowest IC50 values, that would definitely be these two, and you could argue um, uh, in a bigger proteome you would say, what right, these two, uh, th these are definitely these two. Whereas, if you take a look at the code, so I'm not going to take a look at the code, I'm just going to show you a bit of it. So in the code is written as this, because I've used the original source code, so they read the human proteome, uh, so X stores the alignment and then they go through the alignment on a protein basis. So it does it per protein. So this means a protein for an MHC complex for 2%. And in this example what the code of the original study did, it picks the 2% per protein. So that means, back to our example, that in the original code, this would be a binder, and these two would also be binders, because within the protein it's within the lowest 2%. Um, so that may be a different, uh, that may result in a different result. Uh, so what I did is, I'm going to use the IC50 value in the lowest 2% of all IC50 values. And from all, I, I, I can't simulate all IC50, all peptide fragments, because um, especially if you have a 13 mer, that means you have 20 to the power of 13 combinations. Instead I just use 10,000 random peptides. And with that way I can, I, I pick, I get the distribution of IC50 values and I use a cutoff at the lowest 2%. And I wrote a package exactly only for this, it's called MHC and Preds, uh, MHC Nuggets, Predictions, brilliant name. So this is how it looks. If you say, all right, um, if you if you select for a peptide length of nine or um, thirteen or whatever lang length for this haplotype, I want to find the cutoff value below which we're going to call something a binder for a percentage percentile of two percent. So now uh, all IC50 values below this IC50 are defined binders, because they bind more strong to the MHC complex. And in the end I wrote a package to combine all of these, called the build a big bianchi bohat question. It does TMH prediction, uh, IC50 prediction, and determine if it's a binder or not. So that's great. So this is how it looks. Uh, you put in a peptide, a protein, a haplotype, 
the length of the peptides to be bounding to the MHC complexes and the percentile at which you call something a binder and you get exactly the table I've showed earlier. And that only takes 55 seconds on average. So that's easy uh, because you can then run it on a computer cluster where you have thousands of nodes so that should be easy. Uh, I'm not going to show the old results. So you may think that I'm done but scaling up may be harder than you think and now I'm going to show you a bit of um, the problems I face with. So let's do some um, some simple calculations. So the human proteome has uh, 75,000 proteins and we are looking for 34 haplotypes and one protein takes 55 seconds on average. That means in total the calculation will be 1623 days. So that's more than you may have expected. But of course you can um, what you can do you can spl you can split up the calculation in jobs. Um, and if let's say you split it in a hundred jobs or at least you have a hundred jobs running at all the at the same time, it will only take a bit more than 16 days to get your result, which is uh, which is manageable, that's fine. However, um, there's a problem because you can't submit all jobs. So we need well, I think 2.6 million jobs. You can't submit all of them at once. That means uh, because the computer cluster Peregrine only allows a thousand jobs max. So what I did, I wrote some code to always fill up um, the jobs, the job queue, because a job is put in a queue, to fill it up to 950 jobs. So there are always approximately 950 jobs waiting in the queue to be running. That doesn't guarantee they are ran, um, but at least um, there won't be time wasted in um, uh, that there's no queue. However, a problem is the number of files as well. So if you have this many uh, jobs, we also have that many uh, million of files. And the computer cluster only allows for 1.1 million files. So that means um, that I can work with that. That means sometimes I have to zip files and move them away. Um, I can do that, that's easy. But it's um, like most people don't expect that you have to respect a maximum number of files uh, on a computer. Working with files is is way harder than you would expect. For example, this command, um, ls means, uh, in Windows it's called dir, uh, star.csv, uh, ls means show me the files that, uh, like show all files in the folder you are, or the directory you are, and only with the csv extension, the comma separated file extension. And that's a very commonly used command by me. Um, sadly, this command is run by the terminal, by bash, and you can only have two million characters for the arguments. And because a CSV file name, in my example, has 23 characters on average, I cannot use these, even this basic command after 87,000 files. So I can work with that. You can use like other ways to do the same thing. And it's just way harder. It's a bit clumsy as well, but I'm uh, sure you can do that. But most people don't expect that uh, that you simply can't see all your files anymore. Well, let's take a look at the file size because that's also a problem. So one job gives me one file that contains the counts, which are only four values, and contain creates a log file. Um, well, if you scale that up to the million of jobs I need, if I only keep the counts, which is the minimum I use, I already have 20.4 20 gigabytes. And if, if I add the log files, I get to 150 gigabytes in total. And the limit of the cluster is 250 gigabytes. So if I have all the files on the cluster and I zip it, I predict zipping goes fine, but it may also be wrong. And it sounds doable to me. But then the question is, so I started this four days ago. Like how fast is it really? So the first job with this setup I started uh, four days ago. And as of this morning, there were 2,000 something proteins done. So that means on average it does 500 proteins a day. But the human proteome is 75,000. So that means that I expect the expected time of arrival uh, that it takes uh, 150 days. 
Um, so that's not fast enough because then my contract has already ended. So the conclusions that I'm drawing from all of this is that I'm already can be very happy because I, I already wrote at least five packages there, perhaps some more, um, that can be used by anyone and is also already used by other people. Sadly, this 55 seconds per job, what you would expect to be awesome, still results in 150 days of running, which is not awesome. So instead of doing the full run, I probably can use the partial results, probably I will use the partial results, but I will be needing to use older methods that are faster. So that was my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. Normally you would ask a question, but uh, this is a YouTube video, so you can't. I wish you a very good day. Bye.